Lemur, hello. Back again for another episode of Mono We Mono, episode 8. I got the episode correct this time. I got it wrong last time around. But I'm happy to say I am joined by Keith Hughes here in the Lemur HQ in Drogheda, County Loud, Ireland. Uh, very happy to have him join me. We've been planning this for quite a while. He was on this profile, I don't know how many months ago it was, just a little preview um, about what we were going to talk about, which you can check in the uh, previous cast here in Lemur. So, I prefer to let my guests do a quick intro, who they are, where they're from, what they do. Keith, welcome to Mono We Mono. Hi, Chio Shane for having me. Uh, yeah, I guess we spoke last August, September. I kind of documented my last couple of weeks of doing the Dublin Marathon and maybe I fell off the bandwagon there because I was just so sore after it. <laughs> but uh, no, listen, I guess it's came back up on board because I'm setting up a local draw network group and I felt this was a perfect platform to give people a chance to talk about their business, speak to each other and kind of network in a new way as such instead of always being seen to type, I guess. So my background, my name's uh, Keith Hughes. Um, born and reared, as you can hear, from <laughs> uh, Indrada at the moment. It's going through a bit of ups and downs, but it's... Listen, it's like any other town or any other place in the world, it'll, it'll come back and everything will be fine again and these things happen. Yeah, we can touch on that, I think, later yeah, on for no people problem. who don't know. But. That's where I'm from. Yeah. But uh, listen, I guess my background is in hedge funds and banking and two years ago I have set up my own business as a financial advisor, so for life and family and business protection, sports cover, you know, tax relief, stuff like that. And that's where I am at the moment. I'm... I think we've also, if we have time later on to talk about it, I, I went through a small, I wouldn't say small, but I went through a gambling addiction when I was younger, and I try and talk to young, I talk to anyone, but at the moment I'm seeing it as young males in sport is going through tough times because it seems to be part and parcel of the culture. And that's probably me in the snippet. In a, in a snippet, and we'll get into it in more detail. Um, and like, I, the reason, like, there's various different reasons why I started this podcast. One is I'm uh, changing the game with social audio on Lemur, but you know, I'm putting, um, putting it into practice as well because I love consuming uh, podcasts, audio content, little con- conversations. And with Lemur, I wanted to touch on my background, people involved in sport, professional sport, all that carry on, but also business because I've transitioned from sport into business and I feel that there's a massive correlation between the lessons and experiences you get in sport, uh, which transfer over to business. And you tick all those boxes as well because you're massively involved in sport throughout your life. And I'm sure that those lessons are standing to you now in business. Yeah, I agree. Look, it's massive. It's anything you've brought up, in t- whether it's teamwork, whether it's goals, whether it's driven, you don't want the other person of your opposition to get the better of you. Do you grit in and dig your teeth? Do you learn how to talk to people? Do you learn how to communicate with people? How to treat people? Yeah, it's just, I just can't believe, like I think I had a conversation with a girl up in Crow Park a couple of months ago and uh, she was like, I'm not going to push my son to play sports. Yeah. And I was like, well I am. And I don't mean that in a bad way. She goes, well what do you mean? I said, well you're going to push him to go to school. So why not push them to go to sports? Because I felt sports and being locally in the Ratley's GAA and playing on the Rage for Loud and all that, it gave me a basis of friendship and family, which has led into business as well. And I, I can't see how being involved in sports is any way negative whatsoever. No, definitely. It's a massive positive. And I've had conversations with a lot of people um, about that as well. And it's generally... Uh, I know it can can seem a bit harsh as a word, but it comes out of stems from ignorance because they've never been involved in sports themselves. Exactly. So they don't understand how powerful it is, and it's one of those things like you always see in any movie or you know rags to riches. You know the likes of a, a Rocky. What got Rocky from breaking people's thumbs, getting money to being world champion was a sport, and all the lessons around that. And he said, you know, it's so much more than the actual sport itself. It's the the lessons of you know, especially team sports in particular, how to work as a unit, you know, recognizing your own strengths, your own weaknesses, how to overcome it. But work rate is a huge thing. And it says, you know, in order to achieve anything, you need to work hard to do it. 
you know and that transfers over to and knowing how to lose as well yeah. you know you're always going to lose so yeah. you can't win everything and like, yeah. even in my business now at the moment I can't I can't win all the meetings or all the clients I want and I can't do business with all the clients I want but I guess one thing fundamentally why I went back in this year to coach the Aralis. Are you coaching? Yeah, yeah. yeah I went back in as a selector with Graham Leach, a former player, and Aaron Hoy, who played with Loud and was on the second on the Loud board over the last couple of years, see the team. And my little boys are four and two. And ever since I broke my wrist, arm, and elbow in an accident against Clarehead, I haven't played football. Yeah. So I felt time was to go back in and try and give back to the lads. Okay, will they listen to me or not? Maybe they won't, maybe they will. But I played senior football for 10 years. I've been at the club 20 years. And I, but I also want to see my two young boys, me either on the pitch, not playing, but coaching and seeing football and seeing Gaelic and seeing some sort of sports. So that was one of my main factors with going back. Brilliant, brilliant. So manager, I don't know much about football managers or soccer managers, but Brian Clough or Alex Ferguson? Who's, Alex who? Ferguson for me, I don't, I, I haven't read into Clough too much, but Alex Ferguson is my era. Yeah, he's your Anya United, of course, but of course, uh, yeah. you just need to be careful of some of your your players kicking football boots at you if they're not happy yeah, with you. Well, that's it. I'm more worried to be kicking at my lads with the <laughs> <playing> football. <laughs> yeah. So, and you mentioned there that uh, you've started a networking group. That's I saw come up in Lima there recently, and it sparked my. I need to get back in touch with Keith to get him on mono and mono. Uh, it was a brilliant thing. You know, true business. I've been to a few of these networking groups, but they're genuinely the, the, the way the approach you have towards it, which we'll get into now, I think is a brilliant way of doing it. Sometimes, you know, uh, it's a term we used to have when we were in the rugby, like when you go on your pre season trips and they'd organize an event for the team. Oh, lads, this is going to be fun. So we call it forced fun, where it's not necessarily great. It comes from a good place, but it doesn't. And, and sometimes a networking event set up by, um, organizations or governments are a bit like that they're there to improve your network for people to get on and and share ideas and that but it's forced and it doesn't happen in the way that it should and i think the way the approach you're you're looking at is is more natural where people can come and they can be in a comfortable environment and feel free to speak and get involved and genuinely build relationships which can lead to improved network and business etc etc yeah. so yeah so i guess when I trying to set up a business 18 months ago, two years ago, I stepped outside my comfort zone and was trying to go to these network events and was walking in as a novice off the black, even though I've been in banking and I've been in hedge funds for 13, 14 years. But I haven't been in, I didn't have to ever step foot into a, a network event, into a local chamber or a local enterprise office. So I've been, I've been part of a network group up in Dundalk, which has been very good. And it's based on education, and then I felt, but I was giving up. I wasn't getting a huge amount of business contacts back through. So I've been to all the other local events that people can think of, and you went and not to mention names, but feels as you said, forced and staged, and you never get to speak. You have to listen, and maybe they don't bring you in as much. So I've been talking about this for about six months, maybe longer, and I just through meeting people through the business and going out there and different network events and I could maybe speak to different people and highlight and see other people they were feeling uncomfortable in the in situation. So I said, you know what, that's not going to happen. So I've recently set up a new network group, uh, Draw Business Network, DBN as such. And there's no, no one owns it. It's non-profit, no cost. If we do have to cover costs of a room at the moment, the Aratlis have kindly given us upstairs room there to to leverage and to launch this and we're looking for like-minded individuals that don't necessarily own their own business but are looking to educate communicate and collaborate between each other so i'm trying to get 15 20 people into a room and everyone has a voice everyone gets to speak and everyone gets to listen to your business and how we can help and that's kind of where i'm going i said to you earlier on i said to the girls last night one of the girls who owns a bespoke wedding company, I said, everyone's going to do a 60 second pitch. And it's about being uncomfortable in a comfortable environment. There you go. That's a, that's a hell of a pitch. Yeah, well, that's, I think it's, we've, you, I'm sure you've gone to plenty of them over the last year or two. And 
I guess the nature of you would probably be something similar to me, but you even at a different level is you'd be confident going in, you've been in uncomfortable situations in sport and wise, and I guess it's a different uncomfortable going into a business situation. And maybe all it takes is someone maybe to come over and say, Ah, oh, come on in here. Like, yeah, uh, tell me about yourself. Or instead of you being last, maybe you go first. Yeah. And being, feeling like you're involved or part of the group straight away when not on the outside a wee bit. So that's what I want. I want everyone to be involved from, from day one and for the group to run it itself. I don't want to be, there's no own or treasure. I just want it to be, you know, a kind of force to be reckoned with in the years to come. And we're looking at giving back. I was in with the St. Joseph's School already. And again, this is where I think even you go back to the St. Oliver's and stuff like that. We're trying to get people involved that were in schools in the town and go in and speak to the fifth years and CEO and speak to them saying as professional sports person, did you, what does it take to be there? What do they need to do? Like, or even to own your own company, Limo. What does it take? What would you advise people to do? What courses would you advise them to take? So they actually have, from fifth year, they're looking at the long-term picture of how to get there for the next two years. So we didn't speak to a couple of principals and they said, advice when it speak to the fifth years and they'd love it. So it's about giving back to the community and trying to develop and, and understand each other's business and trying to help each other. Yeah, no, and it's brilliant, brilliant idea. And, you know, I was uh, lucky enough to, to get an invite to it there today. Yeah. Myself and Connor hopefully will go in and, and get to meet some of these great people. And, and, it, and it is really like in, you know, you're, you're, you're a draw to man, I uh, I am technically a Drogheda man as well. Meat meat side of the river. That's the only thing we have. But I am. Anyone says that I'm from Drogheda. I'm very proud to be from Drogheda. It's it's my my town, my people, etc. etc. It has so much potential. Um and and that's that's the big thing with these groups is everyone has massive potential. It's just people don't know how to make the most of it. You know, and they need help and they need you know guidance and and um that's something that this can offer to people and uh i think it's a fantastic idea i really enjoy it as well and, and that's something that i've learned in my journey with lemur with business entrepreneurship and stuff like that it is your network yeah it's your network going your team the people around you that help you succeed like-minded people and you know show me your friends i'll show you your future mm. situation exactly. yeah and, and, we all have bad days like some yeah. people wake up and say oh what am i doing today or what did i do today and Look, so we said we'll set up a group and we'll talk and this is why I, I, I pitched on it. I said, I said to the guys last night, so we get 10 or 15 people in the room, we're all going to do... No, it's all right, yeah. We're all going to do the 60 second pitch and record and Shane actually has told me now you can set up private groups and doing that in Lima. I didn't realise that. So it's about understanding that this can be used as a business too. Yeah. And not, it, it's social it's business it can be everything and it's about interacting with each other so we're looking at getting the draw the business group the draw the business network onto limo every single individual and use it as a collaborating tool yeah well i appreciate that and it's massive and and as i'm always learning about voice and that's my business but every day there's new statistics or information and i was i was at a thing there a few weeks ago uh, which is an amazing thing to be involved in. Uh, it was the uh, Thoburns, is a big PR company in London, who were who were helping me with Lemur the last year and a half or so. Great, great group of people. But they invited me to this thing. It was in the news building at London Bridge, uh, just underneath the Shard. Do you know that big oh, massive yeah. building? And uh, it was WMC, so uh, World Media Corporation, I believe. But they were organising this event called the Impact of Voice and Sound, and you had all the industry experts, leaders in their field at this event, you know, and there's me standing at the back of the room, arms crossed, you know, who's this random Irish lad standing at the back of the room? <laughs> but uh, you had Bloomberg, Google, Mindshare, HSBC, New York Times, all these people were speaking at this panel, you know, there's about maybe 50 or 60 people in the room, so it was quite um, a nice sized group. But... It was fantastic. Listen, it was great for me because the opportunity, the problems that can be solved and the opportunities with voice that are coming down the road that they were talking about, these are the world leading experts, was fantastic for me to hear because we're already fixing them and doing that. But in terms of voice, how it works and why people love voice is because it's more natural, it's real, it's conversation and that's leading back into the networking groups. It's meeting people and engagement with voice like there's some statistics that they were putting out there 
uh, which which would blow your mind uh, like even from a marketing standpoint uh, you know when you say you've a relationship with a a brand you like so what that's a hugo basu is it I wouldn't say yeah. that. We'll we'll <laughs> say it's a Hugo Boss too. When you read Hugo Boss versus hear Hugo Boss, it's twice as powerful when you hear it. The the endorphin effect in your brain, okay. and and that relays to when you're talking to people. And you know when you talk to when you read passion, emotion, context, all that kind of stuff, um, voice, that is the future when it comes to it. And the same with like uh, your sonic identity, which I'm always harping on about this. And when I say sonic identity, people go what's sonic identity and that is give a quick example to anyone listen here when i go ba da ba 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 who do you think of uh, mcdonald's there you go mm. a sound me doing a very bad impression of a sound you know the product instantly straight away and that's a sonic identity and it's it's voice sound all that is the future of technology and people who, who adopt it now would be like the people who adopted social media 10 years ago or 12 years ago who are ahead of the game but i can see even in business relationships personally when you're texting someone something can be lost in context whereas in a conversation it can't yes tones can't be lost it's it's just it's the way forward you can see and maybe draw that dublin ireland maybe it's it'll always catch up or whatever it's not far behind but you can see people walking around the world talking into their phones Oh yeah. So yeah. it's and that's the next stage, and it is it's here now, and it's just about for me personally, I want to start embracing it more. Yeah, and and that's what it that's all it takes. It's 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 like that. Uh, it, it's great now because to embrace it as a just two things, you know, it's it's a need or a want, you know. And I think if you want to do something, you'll get more out of it. I feel than a need, you know. Um, again, the same saying: people do things out of. Um, what is this out of um des- desperation or inspiration and you're being inspired now or wanting to do that and it'll be far more effective and that passion and emotion as you improve and get better will transfer over to people in the network and group yeah. and so on and so forth and that comes that's not just lemur that's to do with anything like if people are around you and they can they can get a you sense your energy that energy which is hard to quantify you can't deliver that in in a in a text or an email or, or an email or, or in, but someone's voice you can yeah you know so. it's passion i guess like it's saying like the sports and how you've been brought up and how you embrace it and even like how i was brought up and where i was brought up at the moment like even my father like isn't he had a heart attack five weeks ago oh jay sorry to hear that yeah no he's fine like, yeah, he did the, he was doing the gale forced double yeah your dad's fit man. Yeah, my he? dad's fifty three. He's done the marathon the last couple of years with me. Yeah. He's done gale forces, everything. He cycles hundred and fifty K on a Sunday every week. He runs every day, he trains every day of the week. Yeah. So me and my brother Gary, we got a phone call. Big uh, shout out to Gary if yeah, you're Gary, not you, John. <laughs> no, uh, who? <laughs> <laughs> but uh he's actually on this, isn't he? He is, John um, if you're listening, we love you. Uh, <laughs> don't ever come back to draw that there's a hit out in you. <laughs> I can't imagine that at the moment. But, <laughs> oh, um, that's it, yeah. We, we got a phone call. He, he was doing the Gale Force Dublin, which he qualified for free this year because people put him forward because he's done 10 of them in a row and stuff like that. So he's qualified for all Gale Force events this year for free. So it's an adventure race. So he's doing the one up in Tala. And me and Gary got a call saying, your dad has been rushed to Tala Hospital. We're like, oh. In the car, and we, we collected my mum, and then we were sold. He's been guard or escorted to St. James's. So we got to St. James. Long story short, he had a clot removed and two stents put in and he had a heart, a massive heart attack. And he was being wheeled out of St. James and he said, no, he said I could cycling and I'm, I'll be back training. And we went upstairs and then he had to go back in for two stents again on Monday. So he's a narrow artery on the left right. hand side and it got a 90% block. They don't understand what happened. The clot, you never will. Yeah. And four weeks to the day which was last three weeks to the day he went down and did 50k on the bike and last week he was back running and did 120k on the bike and now he's over in town and we've cycled with me brother five there you weeks go. later so yeah. it's and that's listen that's not about the man it's about he wants to get back he wants to do stuff he's and I guess that's how it brought up you know passion drive don't let things get you down you're always going to have bad days he had a heart attack 
he nearly yeah. died. We we did, like he said, if he had to come back to draw, like he would have died. But there's no point dwelling on it. We got a good call. Yeah. And he's back on the bike and he's back living life and he's like, I'm not changing. And obviously he has to look after himself and there will be medication and stuff, but ultimately he wants to be back to where he needs to be. So there's never there's not never an excuse. There can be reasons. But it's about I guess and I think that's where I've got it from and I think that's what I've got out of sport. And I've got best friends and I've got family and I know I keep going back to the sport, but I think the sport, if you can get kids involved in sport, whatever sport it is, they will always get so much more out of it. And I was pushing it to draw the boys and pushed it to gig and I wanted to quit and my dad never let me. Yeah. And I did marathons with my mum and dad last year, my cycle, they played football with my dad and it's it's kind of everyone can't always have that. But try and give something to, try and give you a positive energy or try and help someone if you can. Yeah. And they're all lessons. Like you're learning at the time you don't realise they're lessons. <laughs> like dad it was just in here before we, we kicked them out of the office. <laughs> Sorry dad. I for, kicked them out of the office for uh, getting me bullied when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> Do you wanna explain that one quickly? Be okay. like, what? Uh Shane's dad <laughs> used to own uh a sports company, a sport, sportswear company really as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a sports shop. Yeah, or like a JD mentor. Sports yeah, or a Champion day, Sports yeah. back in the day on Westry. And <laughs> I'm where the troubles are in Drawder at the moment. Uh, I, I'm from there. I'm proud to be from there. And it was a great uh, upbringing. And I have a lot of friends and schooling. And listen, it's great. But uh, we can touch on that later on. Yeah, true. But I, uh, I was playing right back for Drawder Boys. <laughs> And Paul Parker was after scoring a wonder goal, I think, in the FA Cup or something. <laughs> it could have been against Oldham. I don't know for some reason. Someone may be able to tell me now. But we went into the top corner. And I went down and bought that grey jersey. And got Parker number two on the back of it with the <laughs> Premier League patches. And I'd say, if people aren't familiar with, with Money More, it was a, it was a tough council estate. But it was a, it was good upbringing and it's good, it's good people. And it's going through the mill at the moment. But... Uh, we used to be 15 or 16 lads aside playing on the big pitch. Yeah. But I got a bit of, let's just say, I got a good few kicks and punches for that having park on the back. But I loved it because yeah. I, I gave back as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't forgive Shane's father. Basically, I was bullied for a year or two because of Shane's dad. There you go. There you go. So you got back eventually, like <laughs> 20 years later or whatever it is. Um, but uh, I've lost track now with that bullying. You kicked your dad out. You kicked your dad out. I kicked that out, yeah. So... Right, so the the sports side of stuff, the networking, we'll touch on that briefly as well. Like we mentioned, uh, money more and the draw of the thing in terms of peaks and troughs. People have them personally. Locations have them. Yeah. Draw does have one. It, draw, it's a funny one with draw because uh, I often get slides uh, for this from or, or by, by my mates from, who are not from Drogheda because uh, there's a certain perception of, of the town to become city I need to start using the city because technically it is a city and will be officially a city so, sooner rather than later and it's going that direction and that's actually for anyone listening that's where Lemur stems from a conversation about Drogheda city status that's where the idea came from when I was talking to my dad about yeah, it so um, but Drogheda it's going through some for on that side of things with the with the city status and like even last year with the Fla Kyoa, which was absolutely unbelievable, which is a massive uh traditional Irish music festival, the first time Drahada ever got it, and it was over five hundred thousand people visited the town in the space of a week. A massive success. And it was the first time a lot of people even knew where Drada was in the map within Ireland, let alone outside of Ireland. And they go, Jesus, this is a great place. This is a beautiful town beautiful stroke city the history the people amazing and it changed people's opinions on it and what i loved about that was it was we were selling this idea not selling it you know they're telling people draw is an amazing place even trying to sell it to people in the town who are from the town draw is an amazing place look around you the opportunity the potential and they're kind of oh, draw is not like that but then the flower came and people were like oh my god this is an amazing place like we've some huge historical uh, places, the, the gate, the gate, mill mounts, but other stuff that's on our doorstep that we don't use, Oldbridge, Townley Hall, walks, parkways, like these, the, walking from the town out to Oldbridge, you can actually walk now from Oldbridge over to Townley Hall and up to where I'm living at the moment, in Tully Allen, there's a new walkway put yeah. in there, up uh, King and Billy's Glen. It's fantastic. Some of the restaurants, some of the nightlife, 
Yeah, I don't think I, you wouldn't be out of shape to see it anyway. No, it's it's incredible, and and this it's uh, I call it <laughs> again. I mean it, but I'm joking with the lads. Who I call it the jewel of the east, you know. And in terms of history, if you know your history, uh, it just makes it even more fascinating. Like our like Drogheda almost became the capital of Ireland at one stage. The first ever stone bridge made in Ireland was across the River Boyne and Drogheda. Yeah. You know, Drogheda. Um, you know, you're you're going down other things like I only found this out recently, like outside of Ireland, one of the most famous brand names in the world is Jameson Whiskey. Jameson. Jameson was a Scotsman, came over to Ireland and he made two distilleries, one in Dublin, one in Drogheda. I didn't know that. There you go. And the one in Drogheda was a better the the quality of whiskey from Drogheda was better than the one in Dublin. There's two reasons one for that. Is when he came to Ireland he tested every almost every major river in the country to find out which is the best water to distill the whiskey. And he found the water in the River Boyne was the best water in Ireland, full stop. And there was one to taste, but the other one was, uh, I need to give a shout out to Des Grant, the owner and editor of the Jolly Leader, is a whiskey fanatic or history, history fanatic. But he told me this, but he said, uh, when you're distilling whiskey uh, during the process, there's um, evaporation of the whiskey. Yeah. It's called the angel's share. You know, where to go, the angels came down and, and drank it, you know. But I think it's something like six to eight percent usually evaporates in the, uh, when when you uh, during the distilling process. But off the water in Drogheda, it was only something like four to six. So he got more um, product and more profit yeah. from from it. But uh, the like there's buildings in Drogheda, you know, the back of the town centre. Do you know yeah. that restaurant underneath? Do you know the back of the the old town centre? Uh, yeah, Divine. that building. Yeah, that's the Jameson family home. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, so they built a lot of the old buildings and Drogheda were built by the Jameson family because back then there was no good roads, so they need it would take them a day, two days to get from Dublin to Drogheda. So they they set up their home, the Sarsfields pub, that was Jameson family uh, building, built that pub. All these little bits, nuggets of history, the in the 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 influence that Drogheda has had on Irish, but European and global, like Battle of the Boyne. Yeah, that changed the world that one instance which is only five minutes out the road and you're there from from Drogheda and, and it's all this and these are all the amazing good points of it you know and <laughs> as you say we're going through a bad patch at the moment with the there's a, a certain gang war going on at the moment in Drogheda but listen if we can survive Cromwell yeah it's a I suppose it's a gang feud and it looks like it's probably going to escalate yeah. A wee bit more over the next couple of weeks. I guess it was mentioned that a network meeting event I was in Dundalk at the moment. And it was loosely mentioned. And then I kind of took a small bit of offence to it. Yeah. And I just turned around and said, well, I, someone mentioned money more. And I said, well, I'm from money more. And I've grown up and I have family in it. And I said, if you want a tour of it, I'll gladly bring you down. But listen, there's bad people in it, it, all over the world, all over, the, all over Ireland. And I'm sure... It's drawless time at the moment. I remember a couple of years ago, Limerick was getting mm. seriously bad press. Uh, in our Dublin, uh, I was I walked up in the IFSC, and when you looked out at the back of our building, it went down to Sheriff Street and knocked us pub. And that's you know, if anyone asks me how bad of a spot, like I don't mean a bad spot, but like, obviously for for crime, that's been known that to have a gather. Um, arm got a presence daily and I think at the moment or draw the duty now unfortunately it does need it yeah and, and I think it's again being involved in the draw the city status myself and seeing what goes on the, the issues and you know the big C word of corruption and agendas and all that the issue draw that has is it's on the river Boyne half the town is in County Loud and half the town is in County Meath and it's caught between two stools. So half of it, you know, it's controlled by the dock or Navin and they've their own agendas. And as a result, Drada has been understaffed, under-resourced for jobs and guards. And well, I looked at it the other day. Uh, I think, you know, we can quote me if I'm wrong, but I think statistically proven in Ireland, we are about four, 54 or 59 people shy of guards shy in Drogheda per capita to Ireland and 45 shy per what it is in the dock and it's the biggest town 100% as far as I know I've heard the, again the stats um, Drogheda the, the greater Drogheda area which is essentially going to be the new city um, there's about I think it's 20,000 more people here than the dock the dock have 
35 more guards. So that doesn't, simple maths doesn't make sense. And um, that's something that needs to be changed and fixed. And uh, taking a positive out of a negative, because that's how I try to live my life, it's highlighting issues that have been swept under the carpet for a long time. Definitely. And say, actually, there is something that needs to be fixed here. It needs more resources. It needs this. And it's funny because with all the negative press, it's highlighting draw down. And people are coming down to draw, like the flower, and they're saying, actually, yeah, there's a few bad eggs here, but this is an amazing place. Yeah. It's amazing people. And my dad, dad just sent me an article this morning on joe.ie, and it was a list about draw is one of the best places in Ireland to get food. Oh, it has at the to. same week that they're talking about petrol bombs you I, know, just, I so. just said you, I, I think you'd find a harder place to go and not to name restaurants but like there's so many good restaurants in Drawda for such a, like a small place to an extent within Drawda most places within walking distance of the town okay and what, what I don't like is I think I saw uh, I, I know somewhere else that uh, some uh, council in Dublin was tweeting the withdrawal saying we need more gather resources and he, he was just slandered slant for it because not they're jumping on the bandwagon yeah. for something they don't know so it should be in terms of the local councillors here if they want to do something there and they want to get good press or they want to actually give back to the community well they have the resources to go and do it so go and do it but don't have people coming from Dublin and I think another fellow was tweeting from Leash that have never been probably never even stepped foot and draw don't be jump, jumping on the bandwagon so listen it has to be sorted it has to be sorted one way or the other we need more Ghana presence and we had Ghana presence and then it's after escalating we need the flat to be as successful as we know it can be as successful as it was last year and the town is just amazing that's fantastic like it was amazing walking through it when, <laughs> when you're walking through it the, the cars were banned from the centre of the town for the flower which was brilliant and, and the surrounding and the surrounding it was like I think probably the first time in over 100 years there wasn't a motor car or a horse and cart in the centre of oh. the town and you know when you're walking across the street and you're like afraid the car is going to I was like oh there's no cars here I can cross the street as I like and it just changes the whole the atmosphere and the weather was amazing and it's it's People power, you know, that's what it comes down to, the old cliche of what people can do if they have the right attitude and everyone's pushing, shoulder to the wheel, as they say, you know. But if you, if I, what's the exact date? August, I'll get the exact dates and I'll put it up. But if you are around and you want to get down to draw it for the, for, for the flag, you really should come and check it out. And it's, it's what it starts off at, 11 in the morning and goes on to the early it's hours a serious party <laughs> it's a it's it's great like i brought my kids down my four and two year olds for yeah. the first two or three days good food good entertainment those party tricks those drinks those minerals those drinking on the streets and no mates, trouble no trouble well got a present i have to say that they were parking in the fair green they were rechanging every hour they had up mel they had a resource center for fantastic uh coming down well into West Street and up around the market to having the, the, the main stage. If you can get down to draw in August for that week, you really should. It's yeah. fabulous. It's a, it's amazing. I'm really looking and it was this is the thing. I was actually in England for the first few days of it and my dad was sending me pictures and mm. telling me it's amazing and all that. And I said, Yeah it looks good and but until you're there. It's like anything a festival atmosphere. When you're there and that energy and it's uh it was, don't let like bad bad press or bad publicity put you off coming to draw and okay there was there is a couple of events and it's been highlighted through through some uh, what is it what we call it but it's, video it's, but it's, yeah it's it's you know bad bad uh, press sells you know like they they, they uh, jump on that because generally unfortunately bad news is, is more interesting to people in general than, than, than good news but come you know down, come along it's brilliant it's come along fantastic. yeah like the guards like last year I have to give it to them last year it was unbelievable and no nothing happened and you can you can rest assured I'd say it'll be double the presence this year so that won't and be an nothing does happen no. nothing does happen in, in draw the normally <laughs> yeah but um, so listen on that we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving forward on that uh, as I said the, the draw the thing massively proud of of that and want to keep things growing and that ties into the business because that's all ties into business as well like the better 
Drogheda is with its resources, the more likely businesses will come down and more likely these networking events will be uh, will grow and help people. And and that's what you're trying to do as well. Is like the the whole it's not just Drogheda, the whole thing with Ireland at the moment is very Dublin centric. You know, the the rental crisis and the housing crisis and a big part of that stems from Dublin because it's the highest, you know, um, uh, population centre in the country. There's no houses to meet demand, uh, to, to purchase houses and then the, the people renting and it's too expensive, yada, yada, yada. Drada can help with that because people in Drada are, are commuting to Dublin and they're spending something like four hours a day in the car, sometimes more depending on Definitely, traffic. Yeah, yeah. No one wants to do that. They'd rather get up, five, 15 minute drive to work, do their work at home, spend time with their, their quality time with the family, but I coach the your last, rallies. But you I was saying to last week, I was in the hospital with, the, with, with my little fella and walking on the go, walking yeah. from home. It's not always walking from home. Yeah. Like multinationals are setting up now, they need to be setting up. They don't need to set up as a hub in Dublin with no. three and 400 people. Set up, have, if you need your hub in Dublin, set that up as 100 people and outsource uh, another hundred people into draw another hundred people into somewhere else it doesn't have to be anywhere but let them walk from home or from remote offices State Street across the road here that's a massive company up in Dublin they've got 230 staff there I used to work there yeah okay it's about outsourcing things back to draw that's where it comes in when you get city status that will all help oh yeah massively and, and it comes down to like I know we're how it's sorry, becoming a draw sorry, episode yeah. here, but Apologies. the city status thing is so important in that. At the moment, it's as you said, caught between two stools. Drada, you want a centralised government, not government, but administration within the town. It's not loud. It's not me. It's not county flags. It's about Drada. What's best for the people and to make your own decisions uh, about the resources taken in the town to improve the life for people uh, in the area and it's, and the surrounding and the surrounding area. You know. Um, which which is which is great, and there there is some fantastic business people in the town, uh, with the right attitude, and it's growing, and, growing. and that's a great thing with the influx of new people coming into the into the, into the area, have new ideas and fresh outlook, and they're looking at it from an outside perspective of, geez, this is an amazing place where sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. You're here all your life, you don't realize what you have in your fingertips, and I got more. I always loved the area, but when I lived away from Ireland. In England and that for four years or so when I came back I said jeez this is a, a beautiful place you know I think someone put up the other day you have to go away to realise what you have at home yeah it's true and uh, so listen on that it was uh, it's it's we'll, we'll keep moving forward um, the sporting uh, like that Drod has gone through its troubles it will come out the other end of it uh, yourself you touched on it you had a few troubles when you were younger too and you, you want to talk about that yeah, I guess I don't highlight it or publicise it as much. Probably between 17 and 23, I got heavily involved in gambling. Okay, my, my brother is a... He's far more intelligent than me than I like to give him credit for, but he's, a, he's, very, he's very intelligent. I'm more of a doer. Gary's very intelligent. So uh, Gary used to walk with Boyle Sports and then he, set, he, he walked uh, over it independent bookies in the town and my dad nearly took over that and when he was in independent bookies you always had to have your ear to the ground and getting tips and kind of laying off bets and hedging bets and I kind of I got heavily involved into that but Gary was always looking as it for the business and I was always looking at it for a quick book or a profit so I got swamped into gambling and I think it's a big thing at the moment with young males in sport and it's part and parcel they think oh, I'll just go to I'll go to pub and you see it in Drogheda or any town pub bookie pub bookie does a bookie set up unless the pub's close by or not so I think uh, I I was working in hedge funds at the time and I had uh, a, a visa card for 30 grand limit at 21 years of age I was just gambling and gambling and gambling on and I got to the stage where I was going into different bookies, independent bookies, and I was doing stupid bets. I think I got to a stage where I was gambling on trap tree virtuals over jumps. Yeah. Okay. So what happened was I had an O2 LH Volkswagen Golf, which I loved and I had to last year for a reason. The head gas went on it. 
six, seven years ago. And I rang the bank to get a thousand euro loan and they wouldn't give it to me, even though I could have took out every credit card. But I wanted that thousand euro. I had 24 grand on my me, on me credit card and I needed that other six thousand for gambling. Yeah. And they said no. So I went home and broke down and me mother and father and Gary, they had a good idea to what was happening. And like I'll touch on it, we had uh, the Kerry manager. We had Paul, no sorry, Kerry and Westmead, uh, Paul O'Shea. We had him up training the rallies one day. And I think it was on Scottish Grand National was on. And I faked an injury to go and check the result. And that's when it became apparent that I was going to the physio. I had to go to the physio, closest one to the boogies. Celtic boogies was on the town. And I think you have to, anyways, with the, I know I'm going the long round about it, but I did a serious problem. So I brought my mum and dad in and my brother and we spoke about it. And there was tears and I was crying and there was fights. And they're going to help me through and. I think uh, a girlfriend at the time I had, uh, she worked in Boyle Sports and she, I probably should, I shouldn't say this, but I got the statement of Boyle Sports online in one year, 12 month period, at 22 years of age, I had staked 57,000 online with one provider. And I got back 50, so I was down 7,000 with Boyle Sports online. That's not including Powers, Betfair, whatever. So yeah. I had the right to all these institutions and tell me to take them off my don't ever give me an account again go cold talking speak to people and it was a struggle and I haven't stepped foot inside the Ibuki since yeah and I never will and I firmly believe I put something up on I'll, I'll actually put it up on Limo later on it was I was at a Crow Park Dublin match and they had an, a, an ad about gambling in it and I just hit home and I put it up on I don't know if I put up an Instagram or Twitter or something and I got a couple of calls and texts about it and I've met I, I, I actually meet young 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 it's been young males, I meet anyone. But at the moment it's been young young male adults that have spoke to me what's happened, how do I get through it? And I'm speaking to one person in particular at the moment and he I don't want to he, he's personal circumstances, but it affects every personal life, business, everything. So if anyone ever does need to speak to someone that's gone through it and hit, has hit rock bottom and paid for years after, I'm, I, I'll speak to anyone I, for free. Geez, like it's, it's 100% I want to help someone. I don't want them to go through what I went through. I'll speak to the family, wife, kids. So I just put it down and I said, you're spending X, Y and Z a, year, a week. Forget the money. What about the time? Yeah. What can that time be put into? Picking up kids. Spending more time in your business. On your personal life, on your fitness, so much more time, and I think it's a big thing in the in the in the country that gambling has to change, the culture has to change, and people, young people, are getting swamped up too easy. And uh, yeah, listen, I'll touch on it another time, but very serious matter for me personally. And if anyone is going through anything or wants to reach out for any sort of addiction that I, they feel I can help, I'd gladly speak to anyone anywhere in the country. And would you? It, what what was looking back now and the reason for it what it didn't just happen overnight no it was I guess we, we spoke John which is a major friend of ours he was in Boyle Sports Gary was in Boyle Sports someone else was in a different book he's getting good tips and maybe throwing 50 quid on a horse and winning and I think then it got to the stage where it was and throwing on 10 or 15 year on a forced goal score and then if he scores twice you get double the odds so I was going in with two and three hundred euro and I was spending a hundred on forced goal score bets, a hundred and fifty on racing, and fifty quid on what's happening now in the bookies mm. on the screen. So it could have been cartoons, virtual dogs, virtual horse racing. I was gambling, and it was for the rush. I think it's for the rush, and then it's like I'm gonna win, and I won big one time. Two short stories. Sorry, uh, one big once on I got a lot, of, probably seven or eight thousands. And I took money, yeah. And it's never mo- your money, you know? Yeah. And I, Wolverhampton won tours the night, I think his name was JP Spencer or something like that, was going for the flat jockeys and I said, he's going to win everything. I had gambled more that night than the prize fund for all the races combined together. That says a lot. And the second time was I went down to at loan with the same girlfriend at the time at Loan Springs Hotel or something like that. 
and I had stated, which was a silly bet, looking back on it, but they're all silly bets in my opinion. 800 on Real Madrid. 1200 on Real Madrid to win and an 800 double on Real Madrid and Barcelona at the time. They weren't great prices, but yeah. I would have said if I put two grand on I was probably getting two. I don't know what I was getting back. Real, it was a Valentine's weekend and Real Madrid had, was bet. And I was like, I don't believe I'm doing two grand. So I said, right, I think Barcelona bought some stupid bet, 21, 20. That was it now, just over two to one or something like that. Or even, you know, 21, 20 was the odds. And I was down two grand. I said, right, I'm gonna put twenty I'm gonna put two thousand one hundred to get me two grand back and I'll never gamble again. And I put it on, I was meant to go for dinner. And I couldn't because Barcelona were winning and then in the eighty seventh minute sorry, they, they were drawing one all and the eighty seventh minute, I'll never forget, Ronaldinho stood up for penalty and he scored. But when I went to pay for the hotel the next day with the credit card, they wouldn't accept it because of the irregularities of the gambling. Right. So that's when you kind of know you've a problem. Yeah, and there's another thing which we touched on uh, earlier on is your environment and the people around you. You know, uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Mm. Your brother ran a bookies. One of your best mates was a manager in the bookies. Your girlfriend at the time worked in the bookies. Yeah. And that shows you the effect that can have. I was like, in an environment, I was in a factory environment at the time and I'm not saying anything better, I loved it. Yeah. Do you know, uh, but you know, you were trying to, you were getting tips from different yeah. people. And at mo at the time, between Bailey's Town out the road, there was a vibrant kind of racing community and getting good tips. Yeah. And I just fell into that trap. Yeah, and and put it on the flip side now, it says now you're in a running your own business. You're surrounded by other people running their own businesses. Mm. That positive outlook, uh, outlook um, supportive, and and I get that sense of energy off you every time I meet you. And that's if anyone can take anything from this podcast even if your people suffering from gambling at the moment surround yourself with people that you'd like to be yourself exactly yeah you know and it's a tough situation to be in at the yeah. time because you're always looking for the next win the next money and you're always worried about that and I'm not saying this, we're always going to be more worried about money as such and yeah. what's happening next and stuff like that but don't don't be wasting energy money and focus on things that you're not going to get any reward yeah. from. Yeah. And you have very little control of. And oh, on the gambling note, watch the movie again for the first time I watched it. Well, I haven't watched it in a long time, but uh, Casino, Martin mm. Scorsese. Yeah. And fantastic movie, but it gives you a very quick insight into how a casino, essentially a bookies works, is the house always wins. Yes. Always. As you said, it's not your money. They're giving it to you on loan until you spend it and give them more. So, um, on the oh, incoming call from John Granham Oz. No, wait, don't think you should. No, it's not happening. No, <laughs> John, no, I wouldn't record it. I wouldn't record it anyway. You might give him a call back after. He's still ringing. How does he know that we're talking to him? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd say he's probably uh, put it up. I have an answer. still yeah. Give him. We'll try this for the crack. We can edit it as is. Give him. A, give him a call there on WhatsApp, and we can get him to join in. He probably won't ask me. I, 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 I've blocked John off. Uh, <laughs> I've blocked John off. Ignorant man. I've blocked John <laughs> off man. my uh, platform, my business platform. Yeah, you surround sense. yourself with uh, positive people. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if we'll get him now. This will be interesting. Like, I don't even uh, this picture. Put on speakerphone there. So. He might answer. If he's not, he's just being an ignorant man. Please refrain from swearing your life. Jono. <laughs> Don't ever ring me while I'm recording a podcast ever again. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like the two biggest... Don't. <laughs> when, are you, when are you home, John, to do is a this, podcast? Is this the two entrepreneurs reaching out and trying to start like a... A, a business network in Drogheda, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. And John, just so you know, you're in the podcast right now. So. And your uh, profile picture of kissing another man is in, <laughs> is in it too. <laughs> That's an old profile I've seen. Well, it's, it looks... my hair since then. Yeah, it looks pretty new to me. See, so look. I've got the skin fade going now. 
Uh, and the Oz Gold Tan. Oh, oh, oh. oh, he's gone. Is he? He's gone. It might, right. be, it might be for the best. Yeah, it might be for the best. So there you go, folks. The, the power of social audio. We're talking to a guy in Australia who interrupted us. Um, so before we go, we won't go on too much longer. Moving on from that, um, your transition from getting over that, you got into, you touched on it, you worked in hedge funds, mm. so you put your uh, education in numbers and, yeah. and that to a very, very positive slant and then it led you into where you are. And if you want to touch on that very, very, yeah, very uh, quickly. I, quick just, I went from uh, business, I went from all I wanted to do in school was the, I just wanted business. I, I, silly thing to say, but that's all I wanted to do. What, I didn't know what I wanted to do in business and that's part of the network is to go into fifth years and say, listen, have a plan. You don't always have to. I just knew I wanted to be business. Do you know why? Yeah. I don't know, but I did. So I've, I went to Dundalk, did that and went into the Bank of Ireland Finance. And from Bank of Ireland Finance, I moved into hedge funds because State Street had set up and draw that and they were offering me more money yeah. <laughs> and no commute to Dublin. Yeah. And subsequently, I walked there for eight or nine years and then I said, I need to go back to Dublin. Yeah. And yeah. I went back up to Dublin to do a bit more hedge funds and then I just, with my two boys getting a bit uh, two and four, I was just felt I was missing out a wee bit. They were two and just one was about to be born. I felt they were missing out. And then this opportunity came up through a couple of mutual friends, guys that used to run kind of ACC bank and stuff like that and said, you'd be great at this. And I just said, you know what? I'll take it. spoke to the family and they said, and this all came from sport as well. These colleagues were all came from sport and throughout the years, old managers, old connections, old colleagues that have their own business, that high end jobs, that kind of stuff. So it always helps. And I just spoke to my family in August, 2017 said I'm going to go out on my own and they were like no 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 and at Christmas time so I said something just after Christmas day and they said you took that job you, you set up on your own haven't you I said I have yeah I'm starting January 1st so if you can't back yourself you can't back anyone yeah and just explain what was that job what's your business briefly so sorry you? my business is I'm a financial I'm a financial advisor and I advise uh, individuals or business on life cover family protection business protection uh, any kind of amateur sports that any amateur sports people construction workers hairdressers that look to get their maybe wages wages covered in the event of an accident they're breaking their arm or something like that pensions uh, old pensions new pensions and offsetting your tax or sourcing any old pensions maybe that you might have in previous employments that you don't know what they're doing you'd be better off getting them into your own name in case something happened Yeah, a bit boring but listen I'll I enjoy doing the boring stuff for people that can't do it or don't want to do it. Yeah. And that's that's what it comes down to. You enjoy it. I enjoy it. I love the personal touch. I always say if I do business with someone, put my name into your phone and don't ever be afraid to ring me. And if you're afraid to ring me, don't do business. Yeah. That's a great, great uh, ethos to have. So listen, Keith, um, I think it, maybe it's a sign that John was annoying us to, to wrap this up. <laughs> but uh, we got there in the end. Absolute pleasure having you here the Lemur HQ to do this podcast and we'll definitely do another one down the line. We might get Skinny in, uh, involved in the next one. I think he's home in a couple of weeks. He is, yeah. He's, with, he's... With, with, uh, with big news. Yeah, oh really, yeah. So we'll see. We'll, <laughs> we, we might have to get a Lemur exclusive with that one, you know. Uh, we, we'll get him involved. But listen, absolute pleasure. Thanks for, for joining me and best of luck with, with everything. Yeah, we'll have you on board, I think, for the for one of the draw the network meetings. We'll get the most exposure and try and get a good, peop good lot of people in the room and maybe you can tell the story. Yeah, there we go. Thanks very much. Lemur, thanks for listening. Talk to you again soon.